The equity market sell-off is accelerating, so in this video we're going to look at the reasons behind that, but also look at how we should respond to it, because remember our personal behaviour ultimately determines how well our portfolios weather these inevitable market storms. Now that depends on our personal circumstances, but I think there are some really important guiding principles. So let's look at the market crash and why it's happening and how we should respond in a bit more detail. Let's begin with what went wrong. Now, of course, it begins with the pandemic, and of course, that was a massive shock, both the markets and the global economy. What really characterised this crisis was the very rapid rescue plans, both in terms of monetary policy, so that's central banks cutting interest rates, but also starting more asset purchases, but also fiscal policy. This is government spending more money and ensuring that people could keep their jobs through the crisis. The unintended consequence of that was that there was a lot of lockdown euphoria. People were left at home with lots of free time. Usually they had some free money because they weren't going out and spending it. And of course that money had to go somewhere. And in fact, a lot of that money ended up going into financial markets. The economic impact was also important because we went from a situation where there was a very low demand for goods and services during the lockdown period to a very rapid resurgence of demand while supply chains really couldn't keep up with that increase in demand. Now that's just been further exacerbated by what's going on with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. That's limited the supply of oil, and that's further pushed up gasoline prices, but also energy prices generally. And we're also seeing supply chain disruptions ongoing because, for example, of lockdowns in China, which have affected a lot of goods and services which are supplied to the rest of the world. Now, if you do have a massive fall in demand, followed by a massive resurgence of demand, eventually you're going to get inflation. Now, this is a year-on-year -year comparison of prices, but if you look at inflation across the entire world, almost everywhere the primary driver is energy. That surged everywhere. Energy prices have increased massively year on year. And whether you look at Europe, whether you look at the US, or even in emerging markets, you can see that oil has contributed to very high inflation. Now, at a certain point, all of those retail investors which entered markets and did very well stopped being able to put extra money into markets and eventually these profitless tech companies started to fall back to earth. You can think of that as a retail investor retreat. And as a consequence, equity markets derated. The price to earnings multiples, valuations, started to fall back to more sane levels. But because of the very high inflation, the Fed had to act. And so have other central banks across the world. Now, particularly growth stocks are very sensitive to interest rates. So we saw a lot of the growth stocks, which were part of the euphoria, derate very rapidly and very severely, as we'll see. What we're seeing now is quantitative tightening. So not only is the Fed raising interest rates, it's also shrinking its balance sheet at the same time. So it's slamming on the brakes and pulling on the handbrake simultaneously. Now, risky assets, equity, but also houses and things like high yield credit, do not like this removal of the punch bowl from the economy. So personally, I think that we've got more pain to come. But nobody really knows if we're at the bottom. But at a certain point, I think markets will capitulate. In other words, people will no longer be interested in buying equity. I don't think we're quite there yet. But once we reach that point, I think then we can look at more constructive markets, which start to grind upwards more slowly than they did in 2020. The poster child of this two-year period is ARK, the innovation fund created by Kathy Wood. And you could call the entire story Euphoria and Hangover. Now, initially, the response of ARK-K was very similar to QQQ, which is the NASDAQ tracker, which is shown here in blue, but also the S&P tracker SPY, which is shown in green. There was a sharp fall, followed by a very rapid turnaround when the Fed stepped in and started buying things, but also it cut interest rates to zero again. Then we had this dazzling period of huge returns, and that was the lockdown euphoria. Many of the stocks which ARK bought were also the ones which were favoured by retail investors. Of course, there were even more dodgy companies, which were the meme stocks, which rallied even more. But this was a period in which many people said the really scary words, 
which is valuation doesn't matter. You can always bet that if people say that, valuation matters a lot. Cathie Wood's fund peaked in February of 2021, and that pretty much coincides with the point at which we started to see inflation accelerate upwards. At that point, it was clear that the Fed was going to have to do something. Then what we saw after that was a gradual de-rating of equity. Price to earnings multiples reach really euphoric levels in February of 2021, but then gradually came off those levels from around summer of 2021. The next leg down was when these euphoric stocks started to fall due to the one-year yield gradually rising. This was markets pricing in the fact that the Federal Reserve was going to have to raise interest rates very sharply, and they were anticipating this rate hike. Now, because growth stocks have a lot of their cash flows in future, the effect of rising interest rates is very large and very negative for those kinds of stocks. So growth stocks in particular, and unprofitable stocks, but also cryptocurrencies, which generate no revenue, started to fall very sharply from that point onwards. And then in 2022, what we've seen is the first Fed rate hike that was in March. And now we're starting to see the beginning of quantitative tightening as the Fed shrinks its $9 trillion balance sheet by about $1 trillion per year. So I think this graph encapsulates exactly what happened, what led to the euphoria, but also what's led to this hangover after that euphoric period. Now, if we look at the current contents of the ARK-K Innovation Fund, you can see when they peaked. So those are the dates that you can see by the stock names beside me. So for example, Cirrus Corp peaked in November of 2021. And since then, it's down by 43%. Tesla peaked in November as well. And that's down by just under 50%. But for some of these stocks, the falls have been utterly spectacular. So down at the bottom, we've got stocks which have fallen by more than 90% since their peak. What's also interesting is if you plot the date at which each stock peaked, at which it reached its maximum price since 2021, and then on the y-axis, what I've plotted is the fall since that date. What you can see really clearly is that we have these two waves. The first wave, which you can see here on the left, is when we started to see inflation accelerate upwards. And the second wave is when we saw short-term yields spike upwards in anticipation of what the Fed was going to do about it, which is raise interest rates. Another long-term problem which the US equity market suffered was that it was highly concentrated in the fan GM stocks. So that's Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, Meta, Microsoft, and Netflix. And if you look at the valuation of the fan GM stocks, they average about 21.4 at the moment. Now, if you exclude those from the S&P 500, the valuation goes down considerably to just 16.1. And in this bottom panel, you can see the difference attributable to FANGM when you include them or exclude them from the S&P 500. And they're still causing a pretty big premium for the S&P. So if we do enter a new era in which that valuation disappears, because these stocks have such a large weighting in the NASDAQ, but also in the S&P 500, we could see further falls ahead. Now, there were very few places in which you could hide since the beginning of this year, which would have performed well. Energy, you can see, is up 61%. If you'd have bought the USO fund at the beginning of this year, you'd be doing very well. But gold at least has held its value. It's flat on the year. And also short duration government bonds, the SHY fund, which buys one to three year treasuries, that's also down just 4.1%. But almost everything else, including long term US treasuries, have lost significant amounts of value. TLT, which is 20 year plus US treasuries, has fallen by 25%. The Nasdaq's down by over 30%, and Bitcoin's down by over 50%. So, all the news flow at the moment is awash with really scary stuff about how the world is pretty much ending, but I think you should simply tune a lot of that out. Don't panic. Remember that the key lesson in investing is to buy low and sell high. So when markets are falling, you're getting a bargain. Markets are on sale and you should be getting greedy when other people are fearful. That's the way Warren Buffett puts it. Now, that's particularly true if you're a long term investor. If you're going to be investing for a long period of time, then these are incredible buying opportunities. So if you zoom out from markets and look at them over a very long period of time, particularly global markets, 
what you'll see is something like this. This is the MSCI World Index, which is all developed market equity going back to 1969. And on average, that's grown by 6.9% every year over that period. Now, of course, there have been fallbacks. There was in 2000 when we got the dot-com bubble. We had the global financial crisis in 2008. We had the sell-off due to the pandemic in 2020. And now we're getting the 2022 sell-off. But if you buy equity and hold it for a long period of time, you can simply buy this drift and monetize it simply by doing absolutely nothing. And in fact, doing nothing probably works best because if there is a market crash, you can have very quick turnarounds. If you sell your equity when markets fall, there's a good chance that you'll miss out on the rebound and you'll have to buy into markets when they're more expensive. Nobody can time those swings, so it's not even worth trying. Now, before I move on to the really key question, which is what to do about this market crash, let me just quickly mention our Pension Craft membership. This is an ability for you to interact with like-minded people via Slack, our chat application. You can ask me questions whenever you like. Plus, you get access to a growing library of members-only video content. Now, to learn more about that, just click on the link beside me and in the description beneath me. So the s and in a bear market, the Nasdaq's down by more than 30%, what should you do about it? Now ultimately this will depend on your personal circumstances, but I think one of the primary differentiators is whether you're building up your retirement pot or actually drawing down on that pot. So in the early part of your life, and for much of your life, you'll be saving and you'll do that regularly. You'll take some proportion of your salary and you'll put it into the equity market or maybe the bond market or other investments. If that's the case, then you certainly shouldn't hold back money from the equity market during an equity market fall. The reason for that is that you're a long-term investor and usually that'll reduce your return if you do hold money back. That's because you can't time the turnaround in markets and it could well be that this is as cheap as markets get. Nobody really knows when the turning point's gonna come. What we do know is that over the long term, you get that upward drift, even after a market crash, because global indices always recover. Now, single companies may go bankrupt. However, for a global index, eventually it recovers. So really all you're doing is buying at a cheap price during these crises. If you're newly retired, then you are very sensitive to market crashes. That's because you're forced to crystallize those losses if you have to sell equity after a market crash to pay for your living costs. So if you're in that situation, if you can possibly move away from drawing on equity, that might be by using other sources of income. Perhaps you've got a property which you rent out. Perhaps you could even go back to work over a short period of time in order to let markets recover, equity markets that is. Or if some of your assets have not fallen in value, so for example, short duration government bonds or gold, well, you can sell those assets, allowing equity time to recover. The key thing is not to crystallize a loss because if you are at the beginning of retirement, it can have large impacts because it doesn't compound for those many years of retirement. Now, of course, this isn't financial advice, but I think these principles of letting equity compound for as long as possible are universal. Now, during my coaching sessions, which are one-to-one, -one, I get a lot of clients who've received a large lump sum. Now, that might be because they've inherited money or because they've been paid a very large bonus or perhaps they've sold a company or a house. But in these markets, it's very difficult to allocate because people are scared, justifiably. So let's say you do have a large lump sum of X dollars. One way around that, just one way, is to drip feed that into markets over some period of time. I also get asked what's the best drip feed period and there is no answer, but generally the shorter the period, the better. That's because if you drip feed over a very long period, you tend to underperform because of that upward drift in equity. But let's say you choose a period of 12 months, you just take that X dollars, split it up into 12 equal payments, and then gradually buy in those 12 installments. Now, if equity markets fall even further, you could even accelerate that schedule of purchases. What you should never do is ever hold back on even just one of those payments, because that's a slippery slope and you could end up stopping the drip feed schedule altogether. Remember, the point of this is to get that market exposure, which over the long term will very much 
act in your favour. It's also a really good idea to keep an eye on valuation. If you're a member of Pensioncraft's community, you'll often see this graph posted on Slack whenever it's updated, and this is FactSet's forward price to earnings multiple for the S&P 500. When this is high, equity is expensive, and when it's low, equity is cheap. And the number represents how many dollars people are willing to pay for the S&P 500 relative to every dollar of earnings or profits generated by the S&P, and that's a forecast based on the next 12 months. And that's why it's called the forward price to earnings ratio. The dashed green line is the five-year average of that forward PE, and the dashed blue line is the 10-year average. And you can see that in 2022, we've gone through the five-year average, through the 10-year average now, so at least by those averages, we're already at fair value for the S&P 500, based on the forecast earnings. So the closing price of the S&P on June the 14th was 37.36, and if we convert those price to earnings multiples back into S&P levels, the five-year average is 19% above where we are today, the 10-year average is 8% above where we are today, and the long-term average, the 60-year average, for that forward price to earnings multiple is 4% below where we are today. So we're very close to fair value using this measure. However, we're still quite a long way from a kind of crisis valuation. So for example, at the bottom of the COVID sell-off, the price to earnings multiple was 13 times and we're 17% above that level. And after the global financial crisis, the market bottomed out at a multiple of eight times, which is 50% below where we are today. So all we've really done so far is to take the froth, the euphoria out of markets and bring us pretty much into line with fair value based on forecast earnings. However, I think it's also important to use multiple valuation measures. Some of them aren't so optimistic as a forward price to earnings multiple. So if we look at Robert Schiller's CAPE measure, which is the cyclically adjusted price to earnings ratio, where the price of the S&P is divided by profits over the previous decade, and if we compare that multiple with the return on the S&P 500 over the next decade, that's on the y-axis, you can see that for the current level of CAPE, which is 29.1 times, generally the returns are positive, but not huge. So we're still at the kind of expensive end based on that multiple. The long-term average of CAPE is around 16, that's the median value, and we're still a long way from that. But if we did reach that level, you can see that returns tend to be higher for lower valuations. And this is the whole point of valuation. Usually the returns are bigger if you buy equity when it's cheap. Another valuation measure which Robert Schiller has produced is actually adjusts for the level of interest rates. So here the x-axis is reversed such that cheap is on the right-hand side, expensive is on the left-hand side. But because real interest rates, that's the 10-year yield minus inflation over the last 10 years, that's actually increased very rapidly over the course of this year in fact, faster than equity markets have fallen. So by that measure, the latest excess Cape yield is this vertical dashed red line, and that's 2.5%, and that's still firmly on the expensive end of this range. And when that's true, it really doesn't tell you much about future returns. You can see there's just a huge dispersion, both negative returns and positive returns, over the subsequent decade. But certainly by this measure, equity is not cheap in the United States once we adjust for real interest rates. In conclusion, the most important thing is don't panic. There are lots of scary headlines flying around at the moment, plus lots of YouTubers suggesting that you should sell, but I think that's a really bad idea. This is a sale, and when there's a sale, you should think about buying, not selling. If you are in the process of saving for your retirement, then you are effectively a long-term investor, and you should certainly not hold back money from markets simply because equity is selling off. In fact, you should be thinking about doing the opposite and trying to buy as much equity when it's on sale, with the understanding that markets could, of course, fall further, but over the long term, you'll get better returns. But there is a word of caution, which is that valuations at the moment are pretty much close to fair value or looking a bit expensive, depending on the measure you look at. But I wouldn't characterise US equity as being a screaming buy. That's certainly not true at the moment. 
So I certainly don't think we're out of the woods yet, but of course nobody knows. But if the Fed is conducting this massive experiment in monetary policy, which is quantitative tightening, it's never been done before on this scale, then there may be accidents along the way. Plus, in these kind of transition times, when we're moving from one regime of monetary policy to another, usually there are unintended consequences, perhaps in emerging markets, perhaps in pockets of leverage, such as the high yield market, nobody knows for sure. But I think these principles of staying exposed to the equity market over the long term, buying when equity is cheap, and focusing on valuation will be universal. So don't forget our offer if you want to learn more about investing. A great way to do that is as part of our community, which we now run on our website. There should be a link beside me and in the description beneath me so you can learn more about that. And as always, thank you for listening.